person in the Sacramento Valley, headquartered in Woodland, California. For the past 30 years, she's worked on agronomic and pest management issues in field crops, recently publishing the sunflower and garbanzo bean production manuals, as well as a cost of production study for alfalfa hay. Um, she's held a longtime interest in looking at the value of habitat on farms for attracting natural enemies like bug-eating bats to farms for biological pest control. So Rachel, this is one of the reasons why you're with us tonight is you're gonna tell us a little more about bats, but also in the context of the Black Rock Desert. So Rachel, thanks so much for being here tonight. Well, well, thank you, uh, Tara, and thank you, uh, Chris, also for helping out with this program and welcome everybody. I really appreciate that, uh, that you guys are tuning in. I hope that uh, through this presentation, going batty for bats, everybody will be just as crazy about, uh, about bats as I am because they really truly are so fascinating and, and really important in our world uh, for helping to control insect pests, for pollinating crops, for uh, um, seed dispersal, and uh, even their guano or their, uh, it's their fecal pellets is used as a really important source for, for nitrogen. It's a, it's a really good uh, fertilizer. So, so welcome everybody and, and, and thank you for tuning in and thank you uh, Stacy, Tara and, uh, and Chris for your uh, help with the, with the program. So, um, so what I thought I'd do for this uh, for the program here today in this uh, in this hour is uh, is to uh, to give a slideshow, a presentation about about bats, so that we can all learn a little bit more about you know how interesting they are. And I think the more that we share uh, about the value of bats and how important that they are in our environment, the more that uh, that people might then like bats and uh, and want to uh, want to protect them uh, more. And um, then uh, we'll have time for some questions and, and you can just type in some questions in the, uh, in the chat box. And, uh, and then afterwards, I thought that I'd just go ahead and, uh, and talk about my books. And, uh, um, and, and the, uh, the books is the, it's called the, the Black Rock Desert Trilogy and there's three books in that. And, uh, and the, uh, uh, the book actually features a bat as the heroine of the story. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you, Tara. So the, the bat is the heroine because um, she's incredibly clever. And, uh, um, and, uh, and so the, the whole purpose of this story was to really bring, uh, bring sort of to, to life the, uh, um, and uh, get more information about, uh, about bats and the natural history of bats. And so that was the purpose of writing the story was essentially so that people could learn more about bats and, and how, how neat they, uh, they really are. So, um, so with that, uh, maybe I'll just go ahead and, uh, and get started. And, uh, and then if there's questions Sounds good. the slideshow, then we can, uh, we can move on. Um, so this is a pallid bat here. And uh, all the bats that we have in the United States are um, insect feeding bats. So we don't have any vampire bats uh, that are the blood sucking ones. You know, those are, are down in uh, Mexico. So we don't have to worry about, about those here. And uh, bats only feed on insects uh, in our area. And this is a pallid bat. And the pallid bat is actually featured. Um, she's the heroine in my stories. Her name is, uh, is Pinta because she's just really interesting. So bats will feed on a variety of different types of insects like beetles and moths and uh, leafhoppers. Um, but the pallid bat is really neat. This one right here because it also feeds on uh, on centipedes, and uh, so this is one that uh, that it's holding in its mouth here, and about to carry it back to its roost where it lives uh, uh, during the uh, during the daytime. And they also feed on uh, on scorpions, and uh, um, they they can get stung uh, uh, by a scorpion, but they uh, they they don't seem to be too bothered by the sting of a, a scorpion. In other words, it doesn't kill them. And they also feed on on crickets, and uh, and they can land on the ground and uh, and then take off from the ground, which is unusual for bats because most most bats are just pretty much on the wing all the time, uh, flying around uh, catching bugs. But this one can land on the ground, and uh, they also have a very um, they emit a really strong skunk like like smell, a real stinky smell. And uh, um, if they get, uh, um, if they're threatened, and that plays a, a role in, in, in my stories as well. 
So when we take a look at a bat skeleton, um, it's uh, this is up. Uh, uh, you can uh, in the upper left-hand corner and. Uh, and and uh, it, it's actually bats are almost more related to uh, to people than they are to uh, to rats. So sometimes people think of bats as like flying rats, but clearly they're not. When you take a look at this uh, this skeleton, you can just see the uh, the the fingers. Um, here we go. Okay, so this is the thumb right here of the bat, and then these are the uh, the four the four fingers. And this down here on the lower right is a uh, skeleton of a uh, rat. And, and just clearly very different. And, uh, and these, um, this thumb and the four fingers are connected by a very thin skin that allows bats to fly. And the skin is really neat. It's, um, it's full, of, uh, full of muscles and, uh, and, and you know, they can, it's just like our skin, they can feel uh, uh, heat and cold. And so, uh, so here's their pallid bat again, and, uh, and she's got this uh, cricket in her mouth right here. So here's her eye right there and her ears. And, um, and if you look again, here's the wing. So here's, here's her thumb, and it's almost like a claw right here. And she uses that for climbing around and getting, like, you know, moving around like in, her, in the roost. And then you have the four fingers, one, two, three, and then four right here. And it's all connected by this very, very thin uh, membrane, which is essentially skin that, uh, that allows for flight. And, uh, and, and the skin, if, if it tears, then um, it actually can grow back. So just like us, that if we, if we get a cut on our finger, that, uh, that, that, that will heal. So, uh, so the uh, wings of bats will also heal. And, and if you look really closely, you can see all these lines that are, that are in the wing. And those are the muscles. And that really allows the bat to be like an amazing acrobat in the, in the air where it can flip upside down or it can go sideways and, and just makes it incredibly uh, maneuverable uh, um, in the air. And they can fly you know, up to 40 to, you know, miles an hour and they can go into dives up to 80 miles an hour. And it's just all these wings that their wings that are just incredible with all those striations and muscles being able to control that, uh, that power and, and agility. So um, this is a mother bat here, and uh, her eye is here and her ear. She's, so she's, of course, she's hanging upside down. And this is her little baby pup uh, that she's holding against her belly. And the pups are born uh, bald, so they don't, uh, they don't have any hair when they're, when they're born. And they can't fly either. And so mothers generally have one baby a year. Sometimes they can have twins. And they'll nurse their baby for about maybe seven to 10 weeks. Uh, and then the baby will um, eventually uh, be able to fly. But it takes a while, a good seven to 10 weeks of nursing before, before the, her baby will develop enough uh, to be able to fly. And, and what's really neat is that it used to be, people used to think that, uh, that bats would just feed anybody's baby, but they, they actually nurse their, their own. And uh, this is a, um, a cave, a picture in a cave where you have a, a one mother bat right here. You know, these are her ears and her eyes. And then all these little bald spots right here, that, those are heads of uh, babies. And, uh, and um, she's able to find her own baby in a, in a crowded cave with millions of bats. And uh, she remembers um, she, when she goes out to feed at night to collect insects and to eat insects, um, she comes back several times at night to feed her baby and she'll call out to it. And, uh, and then the baby will call back and then she uses a sense of smell to locate her young to, uh, to, to nurse it. And uh, bats live about, uh, about uh, 20 years in the wild and maybe 30 to 40 years in captivity. So they are, they're incredibly long lived. So um, this is a big brown bat and, uh, and, and the males and, um, they tend to live individually and sometimes in groups of uh, males that are called bachelor colonies, whereas it's the females and the young that are uh, pretty much roosting together. So, so the males and the females actually uh, roost uh, individually and uh, the males roost separately from, uh, from the females and, and the young. But what's interesting is that at night, so when the bats, uh, when they go out to feed, they can't feed all night long, you know, they get tired, so they need to rest. And, uh, and digest their food. And so they have what are called these night roosts. And this is where the males and the females will gather and they'll just hang out 
for a couple of hours in the middle of the night and digest their food. And then in the morning, they'll, uh, they'll go out and feed a little bit more and then they go back to their, to their separate roost. So if you see like a lone male, a lone bat just somewhere in a little crevice, then it means you have a male that, uh, that's there. Whereas if you have groups of bats, it'll be a colony of, um, of females and they're young. So where do we find bats? Um, pretty much everywhere. Um, we'll find them in caves, in rocky crevices. You find them in barns. You'll find them in trees. Um, this is a picture of me uh, underneath a, uh, the, the causeway that's in between Sacramento and, uh, and Davis. And uh, the bats are roosting in and exp the expansion joints there. And you can actually go and, and get tours of, uh, to watch the bats come out. There's maybe 300,000 that are there. Rachel, and we have a question about that actually, not about the causeway, but someone is also, while you're on this topic, wondering uh, where bats can be found in the Black Rock Desert. And they said they could take their answer anytime, but you happen to okay. start talking about where oh, they live yeah. immediately yeah. as that question came up. So. You know, a lot of them are just roosting oh. in, uh, um, in trees. So there's tree hollows and uh, they, they're down in, the, uh, in holes in trees or they're behind uh, tree bark or they're in caves or they're in uh, probably in some of the, uh, the rocky outcroppings. And I'm sure they're in people's barns as well and, uh, and, and perhaps under some bridges and the expansion joints. So anywhere there's uh, cracks or crevices is where uh, the bats are roosting. They're very, they're very secretive. We just don't see them because they're, you know, they're, they're out at night and during the day they're hiding. Um, so good question. Uh, and, uh, and this is, they're also, um, you can also put up bat houses. This is a picture of me looking up into a house and uh, there's uh, bats that roost in, uh, in these houses and then they come out through the bottom. So that this lower picture right here, if you look up, these are the slats in the bat house. So now we're looking into the bat house and you can see all these little faces right here that, uh, that are bats that are looking down. Uh, and are you holding like, is that, are, are you listening to them or are you looking at them? What are you holding yeah. now? So this one here is a flashlight, but actually I have a bat detector right here. <laughs> and so bats, um, I'll get to this, but bats echolocate. So they find their prey by emitting a high frequency call and uh, that call bounces off objects and, it, and, uh, and they, they then perceive it with their well-developed large ears and, and it forms pictures in their minds. So just like we use sight to see things and perceive our environment, bats are using echolocation or sound waves to, uh, to sense their environment. And so we use uh, bat detectors like this one right here for, um, for picking up bats. And basically this takes a high frequency echolocation sound and converts it into a into an audible sound so if i just like huh. put my fingers together like this i can if you can hear that little squeak yeah i can hear it a little and each bat has its own particular frequency so some bats are echolocating at really high levels that we'd never be able to hear and then some you could almost maybe hear some of the larger bats you hear so sort of clicks and uh, yeah, so these are, these are how, how uh, scientists then monitor bats is that they have these bat detectors and they know species by, um, by the frequency of that, of that particular call. Wow. Yeah, good so question. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, so this is a spotted bat. And again, this is how they're echolocating is that uh, emitting a call and it bounces off the object. And then it comes back and they have these really well-developed ears that, uh, that allow them to, uh, to sense those uh, echolocation calls. So that they're again using um, echolocation just like we use sight to, uh, to navigate and to uh, find their prey. <clears throat> But um, bats also have really good eyesight. And, uh, and so that's blind as a bat is a total myth. So everybody always thinks so oh, bats are blind, but they're not. Uh, they, they also have really good eyesight and they'll use their sight when hunting for prey. So um, sometimes a lot of insects uh, can hear a bat, like a moth can actually detect a bat echolocation and they don't wanna be food. They don't wanna be eaten by the bat. So they can detect it, and as soon as they hear an echolocation, they'll fold their wings and basically drop to the ground. Well, then the bat loses out on a meal, and so that's no good either for the bat. So sometimes they'll just shut off their echolocation, and they'll just, uh, they'll just search for the insects just visually, and uh, that way able to, uh, to catch their prey. 
So, so most, um, most bats are, are hunting prey uh, on the wing, so to speak. So they're getting their meals on the wing and sometimes they'll scoop up insects in their wings or their, their, their uh, tail pouches and, uh, and then glean them out of their wings. Uh, the pallid bat is the one that, uh, that hunts the uh, um, insects on, on the ground. And uh, so this is, a, this is the uh, pallid bat that's eating a, a scorpion right here. And um, there's some bats that also feed on uh, nectar and pollen, and uh, in particular down in the desert southwest, like in uh, Arizona and Southern California, that uh, a lot of the bats there will feed on, uh, on nectar and pollen. And, uh, and, and even people who have like hummingbird feeders out that, uh, that they find that they get completely drained in the morning and it turns out bats are actually uh, feasting on the nectar that they're putting out and they're thinking that it's out for the hummingbirds, but uh, in fact, they're actually uh, feeding bats. And even the pallid bat, uh, um, that they, uh, they actually will move and um, migrate and move around and during the winter time, um, they'll go down into the uh, desert Southwest and uh, they'll, uh, they'll also feed on, uh, on cactus, like this is the giant saguaro cactus, and they'll feed on uh, nectar and pollen and the uh, cactus fruit as well. So bats uh, are um, important for, uh, for helping to pollinate a lot of different plants. Um, and even uh, in the wild, uh, for example, for bananas, uh, this is a bat that's, uh, that's feeding on the pollen of a uh, wild uh, banana plant. And they're also really important for helping uh, to, uh, to disperse uh, seed. So, so we don't have these fruit bats in, uh, in, northern, uh, in the northern part of US. It's basically only the, uh, the desert southwest. But so this is a tropical bat. And it just shows an example of how what they're doing is they're eating this, uh, this fruit and they're ingesting seeds from the fruit. And then they're sort of scattering and spreading seeds to uh, to help uh, with the uh, dispersal of plants, and it just is really healthy for um, for our ecosystems because because uh, this is how the plants end up propagating. Mm -hmm. In uh, in Costa Rica, there's frog eating bats, and uh, just look at this wing. Isn't this neat? So here's its thumb right here, and again the uh, the four fingers connected by this uh, really thin uh, membrane. But there's the uh, um, there are these bats that can can feed on frogs and uh, they can actually tell a poisonous frog from an edible frog by just the um, the call of the frog if the, the certain calls they won't they won't uh, they won't feed on that frog because they know that it's poisonous hmm. and and then you even have fish eating bats too so they don't dive underwater but they they're like birds and they uh, they will skim across the water like an eagle and and find uh, find their prey and then uh, this is the vampire and uh, the vampire bat. We don't have this in, uh, in California or in anywhere in the United States. This is down in uh, Mexico. And, uh, and they do, you know, they do drink blood uh, primarily from cattle. They don't really like people. Um, if an opportunity exists, I imagine they would. But, uh, but vampires really do prefer uh, uh, cattle. Uh, and, uh, um, and and these guys are really neat. I once saw a colony of these in a zoo and, uh, and they fold in their wings um, and then they, they use their wings as like, as like, like peg legs and, uh, and can zip around on the ground. They're, they're incredibly fast. And um, that is so, so crazy to look at. I can't even, I, I have to see a video of that. Like I, yeah, I, I wonder if there is one. Yeah, it's, it's really neat. Crusty. They're so fast. It's really, it's really amazing. There's also a question. Uh, someone is asking if uh, are vampire bats migrating north from Margie? Are they migrating north? Yes, this is uh, the question. Are vampire no. bats migrating north? No, mm -mm, yes. not no. Mm -mm. All right. No, they're they're I think here so far. Species. Yeah, they're more of a tropical species. The, the important thing about vampire bats is, they, uh, uh, is that they have a saliva that's an anticoagulant that prevents you know, the blood clots. And so there's uh, been a lot of interest in uh, studying the saliva of bats for, uh, for preventing blood clots. All right, that's interesting. Yeah, great question, um, guys. There's also a question, are there any, oh, this is going back to pollination. Do you wanna, do you wanna keep doing questions as we go or would you rather get to that more at the end? Okay, so this one says, are there any plants that are completely dependent on bats for pollination? Oh yeah, the agave plant. Yeah, so the agave plant, that's a super good question. So the, uh, the agave plant is where we get tequila. 
and uh, and without bats we would not have tequila and so that's one example where uh, bats are just essential for for pollinating agave plants so that uh, so that um, uh, without without that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have any uh, any tequila production so that's and really agave nectar which I you know which I sometimes like in my tea and maybe right. on some rice krispies or something you know it's yeah. kind of a honey alternative yeah, it <laughs> um, is it's good. Nice. Good. There's also the question, um, have bats been affected by any zoonotic diseases from humans or possibly vice versa? That's a really good question about the, uh, just the whole issue of the, uh, the coronaviruses. And mm -hmm. so, um, so bats, you know, they, they carry coronaviruses and they, they always have. It's just a, a part of who their genetic makeup and uh, and and normally, you know, these uh, these we don't we don't pass viruses between animals and people. It just it really you know that that bats have always had it, and uh, and and then uh, they have diseases that uh, that they get, and we have diseases that we get, and they don't pass them uh, back and forth at all. Hmm. So occasionally, in really in rare circumstances, what happens is that uh, is that. Somehow, in, in the case of, for example, this uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, this coronavirus that we have right now, that, that it is dis it's distantly related to a bat. So they think it came from a bat, but it had to have some intermediary host and so a, a middle host. And so because you can't, you can't get that, that virus from a bat, period. So it went from a bat to another animal and then a human somehow came in contact with the other animal and got it from that animal. Exactly. So they think maybe it happened like in a wet market in China, you know, where you have, it's been a huge issue where you have wild animals, you know, that people go out and collect and forage for and eat and sell. And when you're bringing all those animals together, like bats and maybe a pangolin or other animals, you're bringing them all together, then they then they can share those diseases, and it mutates, and it goes into another oh. animal, and it goes into people. So that sure. So, so direct transmit, although it, it, from a bat to a human. No, no. and we yeah. can't, and we don't, we won't transmit the disease from you know from us from back. Us. To back. It's all mutated, and it's completely interesting. Different. Okay, well, thank you so much. Now, um, and now back to our oh. peg leg friend. No. <laughs> So, um, so I just wanted to go through some of the bats that we can find here uh, the, cool. in, in our area. There's 23 species of bats that are in Nevada. Probably one of the more common one is the uh, Mexican free-tailed bat. It's also sometimes the Brazilian free-tailed bat. And uh, this bat is really interesting because it forms these incredibly large colonies. Like down in Texas, there's a, a colony of about 20 million bats that, uh, can you imagine 20 million? And when they come out of their caves, you can actually see them on Doppler radar because they look like a big hailstorm. So here we are, some bats are emerging right here from a cave and, uh, and you can pick them up with Doppler radar because they look like a big hailstorm when they come out. So you have 40 million by 20 million bats that come out. You can actually pick it up like it's a big weather storm. And, uh, and wow. these bats are migratory. So they're free tails because they have a little free tail right here. And actually have, they look really big from the screen, but actually they're tiny. So I don't know if you guys Aww. can see that here's the uh, Mexican retail bat and here's their, their tail right here. So they're actually pretty small. This is a, uh, a museum specimen that, uh, that I have and here and their wings. So these guys, uh, these guys are migratory. So they, uh, they leave um, about October and they go down south where there's plenty of food to eat. And then they come back in the uh, springtime about oh, March or April and they have their, their young, and uh, one young a year, and, uh, and then they, they feed and they stay throughout the summertime, and then they, they leave and they go back to, uh, to, down to uh, Mexico, or, or um, sometimes some bats are going as far as uh, South America where there's plenty of uh, bugs to eat year round. So, um, so these guys are, are really strong flyers, and they'll go up a mile high to uh, forage for food too. Then we have the pallid bats, and this is uh, this is the uh, my character, <laughs> the pint of the pallid bat, and uh, and and these guys do migrate, but they also uh, they they also they'll do both sort of longer or shorter uh, migrations and sort of following different uh, food sources. And you have uh, big brown bats, you have uh, little yuma and little brown bats, and the uh, pipistrelle are also called a uh, canyon bat. And these guys uh, tend to uh, tend to hibernate, so they'll go into caves or um, crevices, 
and uh, and spend the winter kind of in a dormant uh, state where their heart rate goes way down and uh, and they can even and their temp body temperature goes down and they can have even like icicles like this is a little bat with little icicles on it so they they just they huh. just go into a into a dormant state and these are all bats that are that are covering a yeah, a cave wall here on the uh, on the left and one of the one of the biggest um, issues for bats right now is what's called white nose syndrome and uh, and it's a fungus that grows on the bat's muzzle it's this white powdery um, uh, material that you see right here and it grows on their wings and it grows on on skin and uh, and, and it uh, really irritates the bat and uh, and so they wake up and they um, then when they wake up then they burn too much fat tissue and then they can't make it through the uh, through the winter so it's a disease that came from probably from Africa and it started off in New York and it has been uh, um, spreading uh, and uh, and unfortunately, it did come into California last year, so it's probably in Nevada too, mm -hmm. and uh, and seriously affecting uh, hibernating bats because it's a fungus that lives in cold caves. So those bats that are migrating should probably be okay, but it's the ones that hibernate that uh, that are having some some problems. Uh, we also have red bats. This is one of my favorite bats, and and this one this one actually it has this really furry tail. Can you guys see that right here? How its long tail. And uh, when it gets really cold, this bat will drop to the ground and it'll just roll up into a little ball and, uh, and, and then uh, stay, uh, uh, stay nice and toasty warm under leaf litter. And uh, you could hardly get uh, and you know, rolled up in that little, little almost like a little blanket uh, that it has there. Um, another bat that we have uh, that's pretty common is called the hoary bat, H-O-A-R-Y, because of the frosted color that's on, on the left here. And, uh, and this, uh, this bat, um, it really prefers moths. So it, it feeds on a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, a moth uh, pests um, that uh, uh, like, you know, even cutworms and army worms and uh, other, other insects that are a problem in, uh, for crop production, but also mosquitoes and midges. So helping people too, that, uh, uh, to keep those pests away. And this one, some of them will go down to uh, Central or South America during the winter time, but others, like the ones that we have in California where the climate is a little more mild, they'll, they'll just sort of do local movements, maybe to the coast and then back to the Sierras that are depending on the weather. They are strong flyers. And uh, you know, if they're flying you know, 40 miles an hour, they, um, they, can, go, they can go far. Uh, and then the western uh, yellow bat. This one is in in southern Nevada and uh, and can be found in the uh, in palm trees. And and I have never seen one of these. I would love to because it looks like just such a, a really pretty bat. So they live in palm trees. Are they hanging upside down from the branches, or are they scooping into the bark, or how do they get in there? I think they're actually probably wedging in little crevices, and some of them are hanging upside down. And, uh, and if they're upside down and hanging like up, way up high, then, they're, um, then there really aren't any predators that can get them because it's, you know, what can, what can you know, uh, say it, it, even on like a cave, in a cave, there's just very little that can get them there. So, um, so they're probably doing both wedging into crevices and then also hanging, hanging out, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is a Mexican free-tailed bat that's eating a uh, eating a moth, and uh, and my work is just focused uh, a lot on uh, looking at the value for uh, of bats on farms for helping with pest control, particularly in walnut crops, and uh, and they uh, they've been shown to uh, uh, to help reduce uh, pest pressure because the moths lay eggs and the eggs hatch. And then you get worms that go into, like this one right here, that go into this uh, walnut and they uh, reduce the, uh, the value of the crop. So, so there's been a lot of studies that have shown that bats are really important for, uh, for helping to, uh, to control, especially moth pests, different types of moth pests, like uh, cutworms and army worms and um, the cotton bull worms and a and, uh, and, and, and number of different types of uh, worm pests because uh, they're feeding on the adults. And, preventing them from, uh, from laying eggs. So, so they're really important and, uh, to have on farms. And, and over the years, it's, uh, it's really been rewarding to see that a lot of people are putting up uh, bat houses on farms. Or, uh, and, and now you can get bat houses you know, online at like at, um, Home Depot. I mean, it just is amazing where you can find them. This particular farmer just put a board up. He had a natural split in his beam right here and he put a board up. And this is a bat right here. 
and it uh, it's roosting there. And this is all the guano right here, or the droppings. And uh, and so if you just put the uh, put these houses up. Um, where you have uh, morning sun and afternoon shade and at least you know 10 feet high um, near water if possible um, then uh, then you're you really have a good chance of uh, getting in a colony of bats that can help out with uh, with pest control so um, so I just wanted to, to mention though there's a couple of things well with the bat houses you know you don't want to put them on your own house because because bats actually urinate and defecate before they go in and out of those houses. And I've seen people who put them up on their house and they're just, the walls are just almost black with, with urine and guano. So, so having them up on a, um, like a barn or someplace where you don't mind if it gets dirty is probably best. And, um, and just a, a little note about rabies, just ca uh, cautionary that it, it's, it's very rare. Um, bats do carry it. Um, but um, as long as you don't pick up a bat and vaccinate your pets, in particular from uh, you know your cats and dogs, and uh, and if you are bitten, then then certainly wash wash the, your hands or whatever wherever you got bit, bit and uh, seek medical attention, and uh, and and so. Now, sometimes um, people might find a uh, um, a bat like like in an area where it shouldn't be and uh, and then they'll automatically think that it's sick but not necessarily that um, that bats that when they're migrating they get really tired and they'll go migrate a thousand miles and so they might be somewhere for a day where they shouldn't be and as long as the bat is not on the ground and it's up somewhere high where nobody's going to come in contact with it then uh, then just leave it alone and 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 it'll it'll fly away or if you find a bat that's you know on the ground and clearly shouldn't shouldn't be there, um, if it's not if you when bats get rabies they get almost paralyzed so you'll, they're just so sick and you can tell. Um, but um, but there are um, people that uh, that work for wildlife rescue and you can call people and through the wildlife rescue and online and they'll come out and pick up the bat. But yeah, just like with any wild animal, they're wild animals and yeah. so. Yeah, they don't really want to be, they're not friendly. They don't want to be approached or, you know, picked up by a human. And if right. one is actually letting you get that close, it's probably something's wrong with it. Yeah. I mean, if one's actually letting you approach it that closely, there, there's probably a problem, so. Right, right, yeah. But the bat, sometimes it's just tired. And I do get a lot of calls on those where the bat's just exhausted from flying a thousand miles. And, and, uh, and so sometimes when you find them, um, that uh, um, that it's better just just to make sure to um, if you can you can get like a dust pan a pan and a broom and put on gloves and maybe gently move it into like the dust pan and put it up high where where nobody can get to it dogs or cats I mean clearly mm -hmm. if you handle it and it bites you you got to go in and get treated but mm -hmm. there's ways to be pretty gentle and just put the bat up where nobody can get at it it's really rare or just call a bat rescue person and they'll come out. Yeah. So, yeah, we do have a, there is a question, how do backs hang upside down and wouldn't blood rush to their heads and make them lightheaded? Oh, you know, well, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read a passage in my book. Oh, okay. So okay, here we great. are. I'm going to answer that right here. So, um, so here's, here's the uh, trilogy that I wrote and, uh, um, and the setting is in the Black Rock Desert because I just think that's one of the most beautiful areas that I've ever been to. I love the open spaces and the ranches and the mountains. And, uh, and so, uh, so I set, uh, decided to set uh, my story in that area. And again, it's about this, my stories are about a, um, this, uh, a little boy and, uh, um, named Jack and he falls into a mine and he doesn't know who or where he is, but there's a little bat in there named Pinta. And, and she uh, rescues him and leads him to safety. And they team up with this little uh, lost coyote puppy and they have to fight poachers on the mountains. And so we learn about bats through, uh, um, through this, uh, this high adventure uh, story. And so, uh, so somebody had a, uh, uh, that question about, um, let's see if I can find it now, about, uh, about how uh, bats hang upside down. And, uh, and um, let's see if I got to where, where I put that one. Um, so I, I did, um, let's see, I did have migration. Let's see, which was this one? Um, 
I'm just now going to see if I can find that particular reference. That's fine. Um, I'll just let people know. So these books are, they're easy reads. They're quick reads um, for, for, you know, for an average reader. But also if you're looking for something you can read to kids, then they have fun illustrations. And they also are, each chapter is a couple pages. So, you know, parents and so on, if you're looking for something that's just to a few pages before bedtime, this is a perfect book for that. And if you're like me and your kids are way past bedtime books because they're teenagers, then it's just fun reading in general. I've really enjoyed reading it. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, yeah. the, the new version, they, they, I, I donated a bunch of books to the, to the uh, um, Black Rock, uh, it's the Friends of, Black, of Nevada, Black Rock. Friends, and, yeah, Friends of Black Rock, High Rock, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you and, got it. Uh, so they should be uh, available there. And uh, um, yeah. And so, um, so I, so the question was about, you know, like about how do they uh, hang up? How do they hang upside down? And wouldn't blood rush right. to their heads and make them lightheaded? Right. Exactly. And so, uh, and so, um, Jack is, uh, he's, uh, he's outside and, uh, and he, he looks at, uh, at Pinta, the little bat hanging above and a thought occurred to him. He says, Pinta, do you ever worry about falling to the ground when you're sleeping? And she says, never. My legs and feet lock into position when I'm hanging. I have to wake up and unlock them before I can release uh, my grasp. Neat, said Jack, as he continued to watch her. Another question came to mind, uh, came to his mind. Um, Does it bother you to be upside down all the time? And <laughs> Pinta paused and then, and then answered, well, does it bother you to be right side up? And Jack laughs and he says, no, of course not. And, uh, and realizes that, uh, that bats are just, just adapted. They've got, um, they've got really strong heart muscles and uh, that, uh, that basically are able to pump the blood uh, around their bodies. And so they, they, don't, uh, they don't get lightheaded like we would if we're, if we're um, hanging upside down. And so, uh, so he, 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 asked, he actually asked that, uh, that question as well. Perfect. Um, so um, and and so the uh, I had a, a little passage like on uh, on migration as, as well. You know how are how are bats like how do they how do they find their way? I mean they're like salmon in the sense that uh, that they they uh, they leave and then they come back to uh, to the uh, place where where they were uh, were born. And and Jack is uh, my character Jack and and actually. He, he, Jack looks almost like my son because I told st these stories to my son when he was little before I uh, wrote him down. Um, but um, she, Jack asks, he says, um, how about your family, Pinta? Where do they live? And, uh, and Pinta says, they're scattered all around the mountain. Every fall, we gather together by the hundreds and migrate to the desert southwest for the winter where it's warm and there are lots of bugs to eat but we come back here every summer. Wow, that must be nearly a thousand miles. How long does it take you? Asked Jack. A few weeks, we try to fly in front of storm fronts and that way the wind helps push us along. Well, how do you find your way back? We follow the sun, stars, landscapes like rivers and mountains and also the earth's magnetic field. Magnetic field, pondered Jack. Do you mean you have a built-in compass that tells you which direction to travel, like north or south? That's right. Neat. Maybe you have some iron in your, in your mind that acts like a magnet. Could be, as I feel drawn to certain uh, directions, answered Pinta. So bats are using a lot of different ways of, uh, of, of um, navigating. So they're using sight. They're looking at rivers and, their ma and mountains. And they're also using the stars, and uh, and, and lots of animals are na navigating by stars as well. For example, birds are well known to uh, to navigate by uh, stars. But the magnetic field, the Earth's mag magnetic field, is incredibly powerful, and uh, and lots of animals are also uh, orienting toward the uh, to the uh, magnetic field as well. So yes, a really really good question on on that. And, uh, wow, that's that's so much information, and especially in um, in that book, I didn't know about bats and the whole skunk fragrance thing. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard that before, and I thought that I'd read a lot of information about bats. I mean, I'm no bat expert, but <laughs> uh, that was really I was surprised by that, and I was like, really, they let out a little poof of like I'm stressed. So yeah, uh. well, it's not it's stressed. It's it's more of like um they they let out a really really strong uh um like 
stinky smell to deter a predator. So for example, that um, predators of, of bats can be uh, um, hawks and, uh, and eagles uh, and, uh, and snakes. Um, the snakes can get uh, a bat, they'll, they'll eat them. And, uh, and, and the uh, pallid bats, the, uh, the, the, in my, this little bat in, in my uh, story, uh, actually has little um, scent-like glands on her nose. And, uh, and when she gets scared or feels threatened, she'll release that skunk-like uh, like smell. And it can be pretty, po pretty powerful. And, and uh, you're just like, ugh, that's awful. So uh, yeah, so they do have uh, a sort of anti-predator defense mechanism. Huh. And, uh, and that's great, because our next question was going to be, um, what are predators of bats? So you listed some hawks, uh -huh. snakes. Um, yeah. And, do they um, have ground predators, or are they? I mean, I guess snakes are ground predators. They don't yeah, fly. So, so bats, you know, they uh, they roost like on the ceilings of caves or in dark crevices, and they come out at night. And in part because there's really no predators out there. Uh, occasionally, you can find that uh, an owl has eaten a bat because you can tell what owls eat by dissecting their pellets. Mm -hmm. you know, they eat something, and then they upchuck uh, all the bones and such. And rarely do you find a bat, and not a surprise because bats are fast, and mm -hmm. uh, owls are just can't catch them. I mean, they're just way too way too fast. Um, and um, and then if bats are up on a ceiling of a cave, you know, you can't snakes and and raccoons and uh, and possums and cats can't can't get at them there. Where I where I do see um, some issues is that. Uh, um, is that, uh, is that when um, bats are all coming out of a colony at once, that sometimes a hawk will come in and, uh, and then and nab one just in, in midair. And, uh, and then other times I've seen where people have uh, put up a, a bat house uh, on, a, um, like on a structure and they put it down too low. And when bats go in and out of houses, what they do is they drop down and then they shoot straight up like a rocket. So they're um, so huh. if you like a, a bat like this, and it needs to get up into the up into that ceiling up there. So they go down and they swoop straight up like a rocket, like that, and then they flip upside down and they crawl in feet first. And uh, and they to do that maneuver, they they need a lot of room underneath. And if the bat house or their colony is too low to the ground. <clears throat> actually cats or raccoons or skunks can even just reach up and grab them. Um, and then uh, if you put a bat house on a tree that, uh, that, um, that when the bats come out, they're, they're really vulnerable to predators like raccoons or, or skunks that can climb possums that can climb trees and they'll feed on them when they, when they come out. Mm -hmm. so, so for the most part, like a lot of our predators are, uh, are active during the daytime. And so, and bats are active at night, so they don't overlap. And, uh, and then bats, of course, are hiding, you know, they're up on, you know, hanging from caves, uh, the roofs of caves, so they're not vulnerable to predators. But when they come out, they sure are. And, uh, and that's when they'll, uh, they come out in big numbers. So. And we saw we saw a visual, good visual on that one with the those bats that come out on the radar system. I mean, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, there's a question: How does light pollution affect bat migration? Yeah, that's a really good question because there's uh, that that those bright lights are are really hard on uh, on a lot of, uh, of of animals, and that's why. You know, minimizing light pollution is really important, not just um, not just for for like bats, but also for fish. You know, salmon and such. They they get disoriented by bright light. So, um, so of course, like you know, one place to see bats if you wanted to to watch them sometimes is a bright street light. You know, where you have like lots of bugs and moths that are all flying around, and then the bat will come in and and feed on them or at a baseball game in the evening, you can sometimes see bats flying around the lights that are attracting moths. But a lot of bats, um, a number of species, just don't like light, bright lights at all. And, uh, and a lot of them um, end up uh, just like really shying away and avoiding the bright lights. So, so, so light pollution is, is an issue and, and it's best to try to, uh, uh, you know, if you have outdoor lighting to, uh, to keep it, uh, um, Keep lights that are, but the LED lights that are just not as as bright. So it's, and uh, so, 
I, I worry about about how much light is out there and how that uh, that might be affecting bats. But of course, bats are using um, multiple senses for uh, for getting around, not just uh, the, um, not just light, but they're and and visual. But they're using, uh, as I say, the Earth's magnetic field, and uh, and they're using uh, landscapes and such also. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, that's so. We we have maybe more questions coming, but that that's that kind of clears the question side for now. Mm -hmm. um, do you have more you want to read to us from? Yeah, yeah, okay. I do. Cool. So um, um, so you know, so one of them is just uh, um, this is from uh, the the third book, the uh, the river of uh, of no return, and. Uh, and this is just, you know, a little bit about uh, just about the the lives of uh, of um, of bats and uh, and and Jack is they're they're in they're in a cave and uh, and and you know Pinta is so clever because uh, she can um, she can guide um, the Jack and uh, the little coyote Sunny through through a cave and. Uh, um, uh, where they can't see at all, and uh, and at one point uh, they're they're resting, and Jack doesn't like caves at all because you know he got he got lost in one too <laughs> to begin with, mm -hmm. um, so um, and uh, and he says um, um, Jack uh, Pinta loves caves, and Jack watched her um, as she flipped upside down and caught the ceiling, and uh, and hung by her tiny feet, and she looked huge with her wings out like a big bird, but no bigger than his hand when resting. And he says, that's right, bats love caves. I read that there's a cave in Texas with 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats, and that some bats hibernate in caves, lowering their, lowering their body temperature right above freezing and sleeping all the way through winter. He paused and looked at Pinta's cute little face and said, well, why don't you do that and stay here all year? And she says, remember, we migrate to the desert southwest during wintertime where it's warmer and there's plenty to eat. She licked her chops, adding, I'd miss those scorpions and centipedes way too much. And Jack and Sunny's faces twisted like they'd eaten something sour, while Pinta smacked her lips, practically swooning with delight. Plus all those cactus flowers with yummy pollen and nectar. We turn yellow feasting on them with so much pollen everywhere but the bloom doesn't last long. So we come back here to munch on the juicy moths during the summertime. And Jack smiled at the thought of her changing color when she pollinated flowers, just like a big bee. How's the cactus fruit? Oh, she says it's really juicy and yummy too. He took a moment to look around the cracks in the ceiling with his light. How come I don't see your family and friends in here right now? Well, they're in here somewhere, but well hidden to keep their families safe from predators. We always come back to where we were born, and then we have our own baby pups at this time of year. Mothers roost together with their babies while the fathers roost separately and alone. Jack knew all about bat migration and their use of stars and landscapes and the Earth's magnetic magnetic field to find their way home, but he knew nothing about their lives. How many pups do bats have a year? Generally one, but sometimes we have twins. Jack's, Jack grew more curious. How long do you take care of them? Sometimes up to a year. Then her eyes softened as she continued. They're so helpless when they're born, bald and can't fly. And we wean them after about eight weeks when they start flying and catching their own insect prey. How many bugs do you eat a night? Lots, almost my full body weight. Jack was impressed. Wow, that's like me eating 90 pounds of pizza every night. Do you have any pups? Of course. Now I'm a great grandmother many times over. How old are you? 22 years, she boasted, but I'm still young compared to some of my friends who are well over 30. And Jack was impressed and, why, and wanted to know more. How come you hang upside down? And it allows us to live where no one else can, so we have plenty of places to roost. And uh, Jack's asked again, then why do bats fly? Pinta laughed to catch flying insects, of course. So clever, how come you fly at night? So many questions. We're the only ones out there feeding on bugs, so there's plenty to eat. <laughs> so, so great, I did not realize bats can live for decades. They can live for decades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh -huh. wow. Yeah, longest, uh, sort of longest lived mammal for their size. So they can, there was a recorded bat that lived for like 41 years in captivity, probably about 20 years. And, uh, and and on average, and uh, um, and longer certainly in captivity. I mean, there's just you know, 
there's there's lots of uh, of ish, you know, problems out there. Wind turbines are also a big problem for bats, and mm. uh, and they uh, they they really get clobbered by wind turbines. And and I'm not sure why, um, because you would think that they could detect it, but. Yeah. Um, um, part of it is uh, apparently has to do with the, the change in pressure um, that the uh, that there's a high and low pressure where the wind turbines are and they they uh, the, the effects um, it basically just uh, is really um, hard on their lungs and uh, can cause uh, uh, blood vessels to burst when they fly through those wind turbines and uh, it's called barometric pressure that uh, that affects them and uh, and then uh, and then certainly some of the blades sometimes hit them too. I think when they're migrating, they just don't pay attention. They're just going and they just don't even think about, you know, that they go over passes because the wind pushes, pushes them along and helps to, you know, helps to, uh, helps them to get from, from one place to another. I mean, a thousand miles is a long ways to travel. And if you can go over passes, the wind will help, uh, help push you along. And the, our, a lot of our passes now have wind turbines, and so so the bats yeah. are just flying through those and getting hit by the blades, and and the change in pressure is also hard on bats. Hmm. So. Unexpected. Um, what is the suggested age range for the books that you're sharing today? What, who what would who would you say the audience is for these? Oh, you know, anywhere. I would say you know, uh, uh, kids are reading at eight up on up, but to adults, I know adults just love mm -hmm. it too. And and as I say, with the new books that I have. Um, that I, I put in a whole um, series of uh, of discussion questions, like uh, in inside, and so and then ZamoraStories.com is my website where you can uh, you can actually take a look at the uh, uh, at the uh, um, at the answers to those to those questions. So. Really fun. So, what about someone is asking about water sources, um, and we are down to like we have about you know okay. five or six more minutes. But like we said, tonight's our opening night, and we don't we could go as long as you want, but. Yeah, okay. um, they're asking maybe for a bat house or something if they're going to set that up. What kind of a water source do bats prefer to be nearby to? You know, they uh, um, so bats drink on the wing. So in other words, they're like swallows. They they they, they swoop over water and they scoop um, the uh, uh, water into their mouth for drinking. So they can't they can't land. They've got really really tiny feet. I mean, if I don't know if you can see this, but um, can anybody? Let's see. If I do this, can you? Can you see those tiny feet? I don't yeah. Know. They're really right there. Um, that's their feet right there. And they got really, really tiny toes. Um, maybe this one, this side is a little better. Okay, do you see the toes right there? Uh, right, right there. Um, anyway, so, so they, they can't perch like a bird and, uh, and um, drink um, like on the edge of a pool. They have to actually fly over something and scoop it up in their mouth. So, so they they need a, a a pond, some sort of pond. I've seen them drink in swimming pools. Um, that uh, that they they do like uh, swimming pools. So, um, yeah. So, so and I, and even water troughs. So any sort of any sort of pond, a water trough they can drink out of. Um, you have to be careful though with water troughs. Sometimes they'll fall in and they can't get out. And so it's important to have like a, a piece of wood or something that they can swim onto and climb up and, and fly away. So, so a, a, a pond is great, a swimming pool, they'll drink water out of a, a swimming pool. Um, and, uh, um, and then if it's a water trough, just, just be careful, have, a, have some wood in there in case they, uh, they get too low and they, and they accidentally fall in, because I've heard that that can be a problem. Nice, bats swoop in to drink. So they yep. need a, a pool or a pond with a little handy little escape ladder. You need an escape hatch. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, well, are there maybe like a few more favorite things you want to share with us? I'm just looking here if we have, um, I'm looking to see if someone maybe posted a question but didn't put a question mark on it. So I'm just reading through the rest of the comments here. But um, maybe you could share with us your favorite three facts or we don't see bats in the daytime. We know they fly at night. I'm trying to think about my favorite bat questions. Um, I love, I just love that, uh, you know, that, that bats, uh, um, that they echolocate and they can, uh, they can really uh, um, find their way in the dark and, uh, and, uh, um, and that they can, that they can fly and, uh, um, and, and in my, in my stories that, uh, that just becomes so, so important to, uh, to be able to, uh, for, um, for, 
this reconnaissance to find the the poachers when it's dark out there and they want to know what where are the poachers and what are they doing and i just love that that uh, that that um, Pinta, the little bat, can uh, can fly around, and she can see in the dark, and so she can uh, she can tell Jack, you know, exactly, you know, what's happening and uh, what the poachers are doing and where they are to uh, to help out with uh, with uh, figuring out how to uh, how to stop them. <laughs> She's a really fun character. I have a lot of fun reading these reading these stories uh, day by day, and I am you know kind of going slow, but like I said, I mean. Mm -hmm time but it's a really fun character to engage with um i think bats are a fascinating topic i love that they are just everywhere i love that they're pollinators um and you know echolocation one of the things i think is so cool about that is what other animal uh not in the ocean does that like there's whales and dolphins we know they're they're right. using sonar right yeah. but and um and bats are thought to have evolved from uh, shrews and shrews are like hmm, like a sort of like a mole like it's not a rodent it's like a mole like mammal and um and shrews are uh, are thought to are, are known to echolocate too and uh, and they feed on insects and so there's some thought that uh, bats actually evolved from uh, from the shrew and uh, and then some there's just some birds like some swifts that uh, that will echolocate as well and of course, other animals use sound like elephants and such to uh, communicate. But for echolocation, yeah, it's dolphins and whales and shrews and, uh, and then some birds and, uh, and like swifts for, to find their way out of like really dark crevices where they, where they are. But Interesting. I love, I love all these questions. They're just uh, that it, yeah, because it just brings out, you know, more, oh gosh, more really interesting uh, um, facts about uh, about bats and other animals too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, really fun to study and it's amazing how much you can learn about um, one particular thing. Like you think, you know, bats are just one kind of animal, but then you actually find out there's all these species, there's big and small, they have free tails and mm -hmm. they scoop things up with their wings and they have big hearts. So bats have big hearts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The best thing about bats, though, is that they eat insects and they eat tons of insects and they help protect uh, crops from, uh, from pests. So they're really important for, uh, for farmers. And uh, of course, they eat tons of mosquitoes and midges. So they help protect us from, from biting insects and that they're important pollinators and uh, important for helping with uh, dispersing seeds, in, uh, um, particularly in the tropical uh, rainforest. And, uh, and then, you know, on top of that, gosh, their guano is such a uh, high um, important uh, um, like um, uh, fertilizer that because it's so high in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that are essential plant nutrients. So it's used extensively for fertilizer. So gosh, you know, it's just a win-win situation with bats. They're just incredible. They're amazing. Is there anything special, um, more sp about the Black Rock Desert? Are there anything about Black Rock Desert bats? I'm just looking at this story. Um, someone's question said more on the Black Rock. So I'm just, I guess I'm, I think they're saying, is there anything um, special about bats in the Black Rock Desert? Or are they just kind of like the other bats, but they happen to live here or migrate through here? Um, so the uh, in uh, you know the Black Rock Desert is just such a neat uh, a neat place because um, because you've got all all different types of habitat uh, that's out there. So you've got certainly the mountains and the trees and the and lakes higher up, and then you've got the uh, the desert environment and and you just um, you just have so many different places that uh, that that bats can live and uh, and forage and i think that's why you have so many different species i mean there's 23 different species of bats in nevada including uh, including the black rock which is pretty extraordinary when you think like you know how many species of raccoons are there in the whole us maybe just a couple so to have 23 species is truly extraordinary i think one of my favorite bats uh, would be the um uh, the spotted bat that's the i showed one picture where it has uh, black and white spots on uh, on 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 the fur mm -hmm. and, uh, and so um so yeah so the black rock desert is is a uh, is critically important for uh, for for lots of different types of bats and uh, um and and just the diversity is uh, uh, is 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 truly uh, remarkable. So um, so I think that there's a uh, um, so many uh, um, opportunities for for really um, making sure to uh, you know to be aware of the bats up in the Black Rock Desert and to uh, and and to 
to, to just be concerned about like where they're roosting and being very careful not to disturb the roost um, when, uh, uh, when there's mothers uh, raising young or, or when they are um, hibernating because you don't want to wake them up and to have them burn any, any fat tissue. So, so the Black Rock Desert is, that, um, is just a really special place that has a lot of bats and, uh, and we need to pay attention because they are so important. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, oh, we do have one more question. Do you want, do you have time for it? Because we are, we're a little bit, yeah, okay. They asked, they got a little specific and said, what plants in the Black Rock do bats pollinate? Is there a particular uh, one that you know of or? I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think that bats, um, the only place in the United States where bats pollinate um, plants would be in the desert Southwest, like Arizona, and uh, Southern California. So all bats in, in the US only feed on insects. That's all they feed on, they're insectivorous. So no plants in the Black Rock Desert will be pollinated by bats because bats do not feed on plants or fruit or flowers um, anywhere in the Black Rock Desert or anywhere in, uh, in essentially uh, north of uh, north of Arizona, so so the only place that they're feeding on pollen and nectar and 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 fruit is basically way down in the southern deserts, down into uh, into Mexico and and Central America. So yeah, interesting. So, yeah. And then for the ones that migrate, when they get there, they're like, you know what? Today I'm going to have the nectar. Tomorrow yeah. I'll eat more yeah. bugs. Mm -hmm. They're opportunistic. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're definitely opportunistic. So. Well, I love how much they help us with the bugs. We could use a lot more. So it has me thinking about where in Gerlach we could put up a good bat house. Where would be a good place for all the guano? <laughs> I would love to come back next year and uh, and actually give a talk to uh, to your group and uh, and and just um, you know. And and then I could I could go around and maybe help you with uh, figuring out a good place to put up a bad house. Awesome! Wow, I love that. Yeah, for our Black Rock Rendezvous in 2021, we can yeah. figure out bat bat placement. I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Let's Thank go. you so much for joining us, everyone. Oh, this is welcome. Rachel Freeman Long. Rachel Freeman Long is an author who wrote these uh, the Black Rock Desert trilogy, which you're looking at on the screen right now, and. Um, Rachel also is, as you can probably have guessed, is an expert when it comes to bats, very well studied. Um, she's had a long time interest in looking at the value of habitat on farms for attracting natural enemies like bug eating bats to farms for biological pest control. Rachel, thank you so much for bringing all of your knowledge and expertise. Um, I should mention that you're a graduate of UC Berkeley and UC Davis. You have degrees in biology and ent entomology and the recent, you're a recent recipient of the prestigious UC Agricultural Sustainability Leadership Award. So it's really a pleasure to have you here with us tonight and have you join us for the grand kickoff of the first ever virtual Black Rock Desert Rendezvous. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. Uh, great. Well, well, you're welcome, and thank you, everybody, for uh, for participating. It was just a uh, it was just really wonderful to talk about that. So, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, is there any place anyone can? We have your website posted in our chat. Really quick before we finally hang up, is there any other website you want to tell people about? Just in the last. Oh, you know, if anybody really wants some really great information about bats, Bat Conservation International is just a, a wealth of information for uh, uh, for lots of good good um, information on bats. Amazing. That's fantastic. All right. Well, everyone have a great night. Thanks for joining us for the virtual Black Rock Rendezvous. Rachel Freeman Long, thank you so much for being here with us as well. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add. Oh. Whoa. That's Chris. Add one on more in. thing. Um, check out blackrockrendezvous.org for our talks tomorrow from four to seven. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for the reminder. We are doing this all week long. You can find all kinds of events and information on blackrockrendezvous.org. So um, definitely watch there and watch for all of our announcements on Facebook as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thanks, Rachel.